when doing lang matching, many people do it like this. But is this the best way to do it? Or it's better if we do it like this? You know, keeping a big space between the waves. Or shall we do it this way? Which of these techniques is the best? Do you know? In this video, we will run some simulations and you will see the differences. Because uh, it's not so simple to simulate it and it's not simple to understand the results, I had a call with Eric. I recorded this call and Eric is going to explain everything. I really hope you will find this video useful. Here it is. Here is my call with Eric. I've seen many people when they do memory length matching and when they create the waves or the proper name you say is meanders or how is it called? Meanders, yes. Yeah. So uh, when they do them, they do them with like all the kind of different styles. And uh, <clears throat> in this video, I would like to go through some of these different styles and uh, to show people or to make them understand that there is difference how they do this line matching. So what uh, okay. What do you think, what we should point out? So let's, so we're going to talk about meanders. And, uh, you know, I always like to start these thinking about uh, applying rule number nine, which is uh, always try to anticipate what you expect to see. So um, I, I'm going to show you some examples. And, and that's what we should talk about initially, I guess, is, okay, so what, what are some of the potential problems, noise sources with meanders? And why do we want to pay attention to uh, the shape? And so let me just draw one. Okay. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the um, signal path and we'll look at it in both a microstrip surface trace and a strip line. And so here, here's what it's going to look like. So here's the, the launch, the beginning part. And then there are two kinds. There's, I call it kind of like the, the river meander, because back, I'm not a very good artist here, but you know, you kind of get the idea that it's going back and forth, back and forth. And you get these um, short segments that are close together and you're packing um, a lot of, you know, you get this region here and you want to pack as much length as you can uh, in, in that region, right? Because you're, you're trying to add a delay in a short uh, area of the board. So that's one um, shape, one topology. And then, and, and so we call this kind of a river. And then the second shape is, um, uh, oh, let's use different colors, let's use yellow. The second shape is uh, a trombone. So it's going to be the kind of the same amount of area but it's going to be long paths. And so here is the same area and, and, and it will be the same, the, the same um, total length, but a different shape, mm -hmm. different topology. So, so we sometimes call this a trombone. Oops, wrong color. Let me get yellow here. Let's see, here's yellow, trombone. Okay, so uh, the question is, so what? Why, why does it matter? Is there a better one? What's going to be the problem? How do you design? How do you optimize these times? So what do you think might be a problem? And, and we're all comparing. We're comparing these to, um, let's get another color here. Let's do green. And we're comparing these to just an equivalent length straight line. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's going to take up you know, a lot more space to, to get that same equivalent length. And so this is going to be the straight. So what do you think? What would you expect as an impact of, let's look at the river case first. What's going to be the impact of, of the river, do you think? Why isn't that going to look like the straight line? Mm, what do you think? I don't Mike, know. I, I always thought wrote? the yeah. river is kind of OK. I, I, I was a little bit more worried about the second example because huh. there are elements which are um, kind of parallel. That's what I yeah. was like super worried. In the first one, in yeah. the river, I'm, I would be maybe worried if the space is too small, if it's like 
if there is enough space, I, I'm not sure if it would be like very bad or what could be really bad. Okay. And what do you think would happen if you get the, the legs of the river, if you get them too close together, what do you think would happen? I think maybe the signal would travel a little bit faster and it would be disturbed. I don't know. Okay. And suppose that, um, well, suppose that we kept the leg. So, so when you have two interconnects that are close together, whether they're connected to the same net or not, just two sections or transmission lines close together, the, the effect that, that is caused or the, 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 the potential problem that can arise is crosstalk. Yes. You get some uh, coupling from one leg to the other. Yes. So, and, and it's the same thing that would happen in the trombone section yes. as well. Uh, same kind of crosstalk. And so you could imagine, like, just like you said, if you keep, if you design the segments far enough apart, then you shouldn't have any crosstalk. Mm -hmm. And whether that's in the river or the trombone case, if you keep the legs far enough, adjacent legs far enough apart, you shouldn't have any crosstalk. In that case, what do you expect to be the impact of the meander and the shape compared to the straight line? Maybe there will be a little bit of uh, signal disruption because of the corners. I don't know. <laughs> oh, very good. Um, okay, so you know, let's let's hold off the corner discussion another time because that's a different behavior, and um, and and corners are an issue, but the it's not nearly impedance the, discontinuity. Yeah, is there a small impedance? But depending on the the line with involved, um, the impact of a corner is mostly negligible up until you get into the 10 gigahertz kind of range or above. And, and we can add that to one of our topics for the future. I've got a couple of articles in the Signal Integrity Journal that um, discuss this. It's been analyzed up to you know many, many times in the industry. A lot of myths and legends still floating around with it. But for now, let's assume that the impact of the corner is negligible. Okay, and, but I'm curious. I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? If you eliminate the coupler, you pull the legs far enough apart so that you minimize the coupling, so you don't have any coupling between them, no crosstalk. I don't think there's going to be any difference between okay. the river, the trombone, or the straight um, if they're all the equivalent length. And 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 we're going to see that. I'm going to show you a simulation to confirm that. So all the problems are going to arise because of the coupling, and. And now we have to kind of think about, well, what's the coupling going to do? Um, and so when we send a, so, so here, I'm going to leave this, this picture here. We're going to come back to it. And let me try to get another page. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that here. Let's see. What's that do? OK, here we go. OK, um, okay. so uh, let's do the meander again. And um, let's use red. And so we're going to look at the impact of uh, just a couple legs on the meander. And I'm gonna over-exaggerate it just mm -hmm. to make it a little bit easier to see. Okay, so here's our couple legs in the meander. So now we're gonna assume that they're close enough so there's coupling. So, and again, top view, there's ground, there's microstrip, for example. It's, in fact, let's do, um, let's do um, uh, uh, um, strip line first. And do you know the difference between microstrip? What's what's why is the crosstalk different in microstrip versus strip line? What's different about them? Do you remember? Because the uh, environment is not the same around. The in, environment's not the same. And so, what can you say about the cr difference in crosstalk between uh, microstrip traces and strip line traces? I think in the in the microstrip they cancelled each other, but in the oh, in strip line they cancel each other and in micro they uh, didn't. Right. So in strip line there's no far end crosstalk. But in microstrip there is far end crosstalk. And so let's do strip line first. So okay. we don't have to worry at the far end and then we'll turn on far end crosstalk. Okay. So here we are in, in strip line. We're only looking at the signal. So there's Planes top and bottom. And so the signal is going to enter here. It's going to go signal and return. Signal and return is going to travel down. Now it's in this region. And let's assume in this region there's coupling to the other guy. There's so 
here's the direction of propagation of the signal. That's the forward direction. So this is the direction of foreign crosstalk, but in strip line, there's no foreign crosstalk. So there's no noise this way. The only noise, so if the signal's going this way, there's backward going noise. So it's gonna go this way. And what's that noise? I should draw the noise in a different color. So let me draw the, mm -hmm. the noise in green. And so here's the noise that's gonna couple back. And once it's generated, you know, the signal's going down here, the noise is in the backward direction in the other leg, that noise is gonna propagate in what is actually the forward direction down the, the, um, uh, the, the, the meander. And so the impact of the crosstalk between adjacent legs and the strip line is that signal is going down initially is gonna generate some near end noise that propagates in the forward direction. And it's gonna propagate over there quickly because it's gonna take a shortcut here. It doesn't have to go all the way around here. It's gonna take a shortcut. So it's gonna get out earlier than the signal does. It's and exactly every leg, how I imagine this, yeah. Yeah, and every leg. So let's go, let's go back and we're gonna add another leg here. And so now it's coming up, then you know, the signal's going around, it's coming around over here. Now it's going up this way. And now this is the forward direction. This is the backward direction. Oh my gosh, that's the same direction as heading in the forward direction toward the end. And so every leg, we're gonna get another burst of near end crosstalk that couples ahead and gets out ahead of the signal. So in strip line, that doesn't have far end crosstalk, we're gonna get this, um, uh, we're, we're going to get the, the near end crosstalk that gets out ahead of time. And we sometimes, and that means that when I look at the signal appearing at the far end, I'm going to see nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I'm going to see a little precursor of that near end. And then I'm going to see the rest of the pulse. Coming mm -hmm. And we, we call that the precursor. It's coming out ahead of when it's supposed to. And what that means is the signal, when it does main part of the signal, when it does make its way through, it's going to get a head start in rising up. It's going to have this jump start here. It's going to, it's going to be a start, not at zero, but at a higher voltage. And mm -hmm. so that, that, that edge is going to make its way through the threshold a little earlier than it would ordinarily if it had started over here. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is, that's going to give us a little bit of shorter, effectively shorter delay in strip line. If and I guess closer the uh, elements are, then sooner the signal will arrive. Right, right, exactly. So, um, and it's going to last for a certain amount of time based on, you know, the coupled length. Um, so there's, um, uh, there, that's, that's what we'd expect in strip line with no far end crosstalk. If you keep the legs far enough apart so they don't have that coupling, then gee, I, I would have expected just to see the normal turns on and then, you know, just it just comes out and turns on. It's going to be that precursor and a little bit of earlier arrival time. And um, there, and that's the, kind of the first order view. There are some other little more complicated things because, you know, the, the near end noise is going to build up each time it comes along. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Each leg couples more and more. It's going to build up. We hit a resonance pretty soon. That near end noise can couple back. And, and so second order can be a little more complicated. But to first order, that's kind of what we'd expect to see. In, and that's in, in strip line. Now in micro strip, we're going to see the same effect of near end crosstalk. But in addition, we're going to see the impact of far end crosstalk. Now, I, I probably should have said before we leave strip line, in order to not have much coupling so that they're far enough apart, so A, I'm not going to see the near end crosstalk, that spacing has to be, you know, roughly about three or four line widths. Three or four line widths away, I'm not going to see any, when, any near end crosstalk. When it's routed 50 on impedance. Uh, right, exactly, exactly. Okay. When the geometry is set for uh, 50, 50 ohms, ohms. Mm -hmm. um, about five line widths. I'm sorry, about three line widths and the near end crosstalk is less than a percent. So mm -hmm. a small amount. Um, so that's what we expect in strip line. So when now, people microstrip. when people route it one uh, track width, it's not good. It, there's going to be coupling and you're going to see this effect. Now, whether this effect is a problem and is serious is a different question. Mm -hmm. It will happen. We, we've looked at it kind of empirically. It will happen, um, but... Uh, it's it's a question of um, 
uh, whether it's going to be important enough to be a problem. Okay. And the only way to know that is we have to put in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the system is, it's all about the fringe electric magnetic fields. It's about the propagation of it. There's no simple approximation. We only way we can predict what to expect, we have to use a field solver. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you a simulation in a minute. using. I, I'm really curious about this because I would like to point out, actually, I ask a number of people to simulate this. And uh, <clears throat> it's not so easy because uh, they always told me if you would like to simulate crosstalk, then you need victim and aggressor. So you need two separate lines. So I'm really curious how you are going to simulate this because it's just one line and elements of the same track. So I, I'm really curious how you are going to Very this. good. Yes, <laughs> very important observation. I'm going to show you a trick that uh, allows us to do the simulation using a 2D field solver. And that way it can be done very quickly. We can make small changes and see the impact of it. I'll show you that trick in a okay. minute. Okay. So let, let's, let's talk about microstrip. So I'm going to see if I can erase the, uh, the signals here. We're going to start over with microstrip and then think about what microstrip is going to do. And the only difference is we're going to have far and cross up. And what will be the impact of far and cross up? So let's see, I got most of them out of the way here. Okay, so now let's do the same thing. We're going to start with a signal. Here it is, it's coming along, so it returns and it's microstrip. And now we enter the coupled region. So here's the signal. We're going to get the same backward going crosstalk. It's going to head back this way and it's going to do the same thing that we saw before, a little precursor. And in addition, we get the far end crosstalk. And let's let me see if I can use another color for that. I don't have a lot of choices here. Let's use, let's use, I'm going to change this to blue. And so now we got the signal that's that's moving down here in the adjacent leg. If they're close enough together, I'm going to have far and crosstalk. And far and crosstalk means it goes in the far to the far end, in the four direction. So I'm going to have not just so we talked about the near end noise that propagates in the forward direction toward the end. Now I'm going to have far and crosstalk. It's going to be this is the direction that the signal is propagating. The far and crosstalk is going to propagate in this direction, in the forward direction, right? Oh, wait, that's going back. They're going to cross, and this is going to head back to the source. And and every leg, every time, here's the, the signal now. It's going to propagate around. It's going to head up here, and the and it's moving up here. I'm going to get far and crosstalk, forward going crosstalk in this leg and in mm -hmm. this leg, right? And they're both going to be propagating back to the source. So you can say, well, wait a minute. It's going back to the source. What do I care? I care about what the receiver over here sees. And if, if the far end noise is heading back to the source, who cares? Well, the far end crosstalk, if it is large enough, can suck, you know, where's that, that energy coming from that contributes to the, the forward going crosstalk? It comes from the signal. It comes from the signal edge. And it will suck energy out of the rising edge of the signal. So, so it's going to change the, the shape of the- it's Gonna change the shape, edge. right. And suck out some of the high frequency components, change the rise time of the signal. And so this is going so far and cross, we'll get the same thing with near and cross -like, and we're gonna get this far and cross -like that's gonna affect the shape. And so we're gonna get a distorted shape of the signal when it comes back. It'll be a longer rise time in some way. Mm -hmm. And again, we can talk about empirically what we expect, but unless we put in the numbers, it's really hard to know how big a problem is it. Mm -hmm. And um, with foreign crosstalk, you know, it, it's about long range coupling of the fringe field lines and microstrip. So it, it's a little hard to estimate, well, how far apart do you have to pull the legs, adjacent legs in order to reduce this effect? And, you know, rough rule of thumb is roughly in a 50 ohm environment, three line widths, but okay. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell. Now the challenge, with this structure is because it's periodic. Every so often, you know, we're going to have a, you know, we're going to have a lot of these these legs in the river in order to fit the compressed length. Sometimes it's called accordion as well, river or accordion. We're going to have a lot of these legs, and so we're going to have resonant coupling. Mm -hmm. And so, so we could have enhanced in some specific distance. There will be always this kind of yeah, pools right. or or excitement yeah. or something which yeah, can build up. Yeah, the spacing and, and this spacing, they're typically going to be the same. And so you have a bunch of these and, and you can get enhanced behavior because of those resonances. Mm -hmm. 
And they're most easily seen looking in the frequency domain. So when we do our simulation, we'll look in the frequency domain as well as the time domain. So we're, we're going to expect to see that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, and also, um, I think maybe what yeah. we could mention, if the receiver is not correctly terminated, then it can then travel back. There You're can be absolutely right. Yeah. And, and so that'll even make it even more complicated if we don't terminate it well. We can explore that effect too. Um, now that's what we see in the meander, in the in the um, the river or the accordion uh, meander, where tightly spaced. Many of these tightly spaced. The periodicity, the how often this problem occurs, is related to the distance apart, and generally, you know, there's an inverse relationship between the distance and the frequency at which we're going to see the resonance. That the longer the distance, the so the, the larger the distance. Of, let's see, the larger the distance apart, the lower the frequency to see the resonance. And likewise, the smaller the spacing apart, the higher the frequency. And so we might think, hmm, if we want to push that resonance, that resonant behavior to a high enough frequency beyond the bandwidth of the signal, that says hmm, short accordions, short river legs might be the way to go. The, the second geometry is, let's see if I can grab another color here. I'll go back to red. The second geometry is the trombone, and it's going to be exactly the same behavior. We're going to have, when we send a signal in there, when we send a signal in, we're going to have the, uh, in, in Microsoft, we're going to have foreign crosstalk that's going to head down, gets bigger and bigger, it heads back. We're going to have near-end crosstalk that's going to head this way, and it's going to go in the forward direction. So we're going to have both effects uh, in the the uh, trombone and the the river, it's just they're going to happen at different frequencies and their signature will look a little bit different in the time domain. But they're both going to have effects. And so just to, you know, it's the zeroth order, just thinking about the frequency at which these effects are going to arise. If we want to have these resonance happen at a frequency above the bandwidth of our signal, we generally are going to want to have, we're going to have periodicities here, we want them to be short length, so it pushes the frequency higher. And so our naive interpretation says, you know, I think the river, the accordion with its short legs is probably going to be a little better at a lower frequency than the trombone. The trombone effects are going to rise at lower frequency where a signal might have bandwidth. So. That's our perspective. That's what we expect to see. And now we've gotten as far as we can with just with you know rough sketches and, and rough estimates. In order to gain more insight, we have to do a simulation. It's complicated enough. We have to do a simulation. OK, I'm so, really curious. OK, and, and now there are a couple of tools I like to use to do the simulation. Um, hyper, uh, Mentor, Siemens uh, Hyperlinks is a really great tool to do this, really easy to set up. And um, uh, Keysight um, uh, ADS is another tool. And so for this example, uh, I'm going to use um, uh, Keysight ADS uh, just because it's a little easier, easier to parameterize things and, and make one change and have it ripple through the system. So I'm going to change my screen and I'm going to show you the circuit setup to simulate this in ADS. So let's see if I can do this. OK, let's see. Not sure. I think this is the one. Yes, here it is. OK. So uh, now I apologize, they're really small, so I'm gonna have to zoom in to show you what I've got. We're gonna do two, can you see that okay? Yes, your screen? I can see it, yeah. Okay, we're gonna do um, two kinds of simulations. We're gonna do a time domain simulation. We're gonna do a frequency domain simulation. And in the frequency domain simulation, we're gonna look at the S parameters of the interconnect. And I'll walk you through how to interpret it. And that's gonna tell us everything we wanna know about the behavior of the interconnect, but in the frequency domain, and then we're also going to do the same exact structures in the time domain. But we're going to look at the step response. We're going to send a, a fast edge in and look at what that ed, how that edge is distorted um, when it comes out. And, and we're going to compare everything. And, and we're going to do those two domains, time and frequency. And we're going to um, compare the microstrip with the strip line. Mm -hmm. Because the big difference there is... Microstrip has the foreign crosstalk, strip line does not. Mm -hmm. And they have slightly different behaviors of how near end drops off with, with distance. So we're going to compare everything to a straight line. So here's the straight line microstrip. We're going to send a fast pulse in. 
We're going to change. I made the rise time a, a variable. So we're going to change that rise time. We're going to look at the signal coming out. And between the time going in and the time going out, that's the time delay of that structure. And we can make it different lengths. So that's the first structure we're going to look at is a straight line. And then I've built, here's how I built my meander. Now, this is the accordion or the river. And here's, here's how you integrate crosstalk. Um, ADS has a number of coupled transmission line models built into it. And the one I like is the, um, uh, the multi-layer interconnect library. And this is one, what's highlighted here in gray, this is one circuit element that is 16 coupled transmission lines. They all have exactly the same length. They have the same width. They have the same separation. So they're all uniform. And what I've done is I've treated these as the legs of the meander. Mm -hmm. And then I connect them together with uncoupled segments. Mm -hmm. And so here is a transmission line on the same same layer. It has the same line width. And uh, and I adjust the length of these segments and, uh, and these segments. I adjust their length. So the total length is the same, the fixed amount of the straight line. And it's all parameterized. And I can do the calculation automatically. And, and I built these in a strip in a microstrip structure. And same thing, we're gonna send that same signal going in and we're gonna look at that signal coming out over here. Okay, so okay. basically where the crosstalk is, these are the uh, edges like this. And uh, when yep. the crosstalk is not, then these are the parts in your yep. diagram. And okay. so we're gonna get generated. So when the signal comes down this leg, ADS is gonna see, oh, I have fields coupling mm -hmm. between given its geometry fields coupling between the signal in this leg to mm -hmm. this leg mm -hmm. and to this leg mm -hmm. and to this leg. And of course it drops off very rapidly as you go farther away, but it's gonna calculate those transient fields in each adjacent leg as that signal propagates along. And it's gonna automatically calculate the near end crosstalk that's gonna be going in the backward direction and the far end crosstalk that's going in the, in the forward direction. Yeah. How did you create this element? I have no idea. Tell me. Okay, so here's here. I'll show you how to, how I did it. So, and this is what makes ADS and um, uh, uh, hyperlinks makes this so easy to do. So, under transmission line types, one of the types are these coupled transmission line oh. elements. Can you see over here? Yeah. So here is seven transmission line segments. Here is two coupled transmission lines, and so I'm gonna clear these out here. And so I chose the biggest one. Here are 16 coupled transmissions already pre-configured. ADS automatically knows how a voltage, changing voltage going in uh, propagates and is created, it creates other voltages in the uh, the other legs. So do you, do you need to do also some stack up setup or? Very good, yes. So I need to tell ADS, okay, these are the signal lines what is the rest of the interconnect structure? And so over here is my stack up. And so I built this and, and in the, when you, when you create the coupled lines, you select what kind of stack up do you want? Oh. And so I selected this stack up over here. That's a two layer. So here is, let's see, where is it? Layer one and layer two. And, uh, and, and again, in this stack up, it has all these parameters and I, set the parameters for it. And so I define layer one as a signal, layer two as ground. And I have a dielectric constant. I have a thickness for that layer. I have a dissipation factor. I have a conductor thickness, conductivity, um, and, and that defines the stack up. And these are all parameters. And elsewhere, that's what I like about ADS is I can parameterize everything. And here are the values that I'm starting with. And so yeah, I pick, and again, Everybody's stack up is going to be a little different. I chose dielectric constant of four, dissipation factor of 0 0.02, FR4, half ounce copper, you know, copper. Here's the dielectric thickness for the microstrip. And, and the spacing uh, you, you specified somewhere. Uh... Yeah, so here's where I do the spacing. So I, I set up the total length. That's what I'm going to define. This is in mil, so this is six inches. So it's 15, 15 centimeters. Then I calculate what's the length of each segment in the microstrip. Well, it's the total length uh, minus um, the, um, uh, let's see. So I'm gonna have 16 segments, uh, but I have to subtract off 
uh, 15 of the ends, and here's the length of the ends, here's the space between them, and you know, a little algorithm here. Um, and so that's going to be the length of each segment. And this way, as I change the line width or I change the separation, I automatically adjust the length of the segments to keep the total length the same. Cool. So it's all, all happens oh. automatically. And, um, uh, and then, and I do the same thing with strip line. Um, and, and so here is my river and I have, so here's the path. It goes down one leg here, turns the corner down the other leg, turns the corner and uncouple, I'm assuming uncoupled region in the corner mm -hmm. goes the other leg and da -da 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 -da. and then it comes out the other end and it autom this model it there behind the scenes under the hood is a 2d boundary element field solver that calculates all the couplings between every single leg and all the signals in them now i will say that there's a lot of calculation that's done under the hood here and whenever you have coupling like this depending on the and especially when the coupling happens earlier than the propagation delay in other words you, you get some coupling between legs before the signal has made yeah. its way around here and so you have the potential depending on the quality of the simulator you have the potential of getting unstable operation it, it can violate what seems to be causality even though it's a real effect um, and so you have to be a little careful in setting it up that there is the potential of the simulation going unstable and so if you have too short a rise time sometimes that will happen and so it's it's a, you have to be a little careful in the simulation and you can optimize parameters. So it's just a caution when you have a lot of coupling like this. So this is gonna be the river or the accordion. And then here is the trombone. And for the trombone, it's just three segments. And here's the, the turnarounds. Mm -hmm. And I turned off, I do not have corners in here. That's why it's a different discussion. I, I left them out because I don't think it's a very important effect okay. compared to the coupling. But we'll we can talk about corners another time. So that's how we're going to set it up, and this is all in MicroStrip and the stack up that I designed for these. Let's see. Here's the substrate is substrate one, and here is that substrate one, mm -hmm. and it's the MicroStrip. Okay. So they're all going to use the same substrate. And likewise, this guy here, he's a, a signal line MicroStrip substrate one with the total length and the width that I'm using uncoupled. Okay. So those are going to be the three microstrip examples now in addition to the time domain and they all have exactly the same pulse generator turning on and, and adjust the rise time in addition to the, the pulse generator here is the second simulation that are going to be the s parameters and i took what exactly this it uh, it, s parameters to, yeah. so it's basically looking at i'm going to send instead of a pulse in i'm going to send sine waves in and I'm gonna look at the sine wave that reflects back and the sine wave that goes forward. And, you know, kind of sort of, it's gonna be the transfer function and or the, the frequency response of the reflections. Um, another time we can talk about S parameters. They're a little more- Yeah, yeah. I think we, we scheduled- uh, Oh, we did. Uh, for S parameters. Okay. Yeah. I have, you know, uh, I gave your, your listeners a special offer for the, um, the Signal Integrity Academy, so they get a three-month subscription. So I think that's still open. And I have a whole, I have a bunch of webinars up there about S parameters and learning S parameters. And the best starting place is I have a webinar called, um, uh, what is it? How to read S parameters like a book. Uh, and it's looking at the patterns in, in S parameters. It's a free webinar. It's on the bethesignal.com website. And I have a whole course, a whole 12-hour uh, course on S parameters and applications for signal integrity that um, if they use that code we gave you, I can't remember, do you remember what the code, the promo code is? Is it? I don't remember, I, I will I will find it. and I will Yeah, put it in the, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And so anybody can go to the, uh, our Be The Signal website, you can view the free webinars listed on the left-hand side or sign in, get your free three month subscription and view the, the uh, st getting started course on S parameters, but it's basically a way of looking at the behavior of an interconnect, a passive interconnect in the frequency domain. So and for example, we will see instead of uh, time domain, we will see um, uh, loss, for example. Yes, exactly. 
And at every frequency, instead of seeing the sine wave, we know it's a sine wave, we're going to look at its important property. We're going to look at the change in the amplitude, for example, of the sine wave compared with the coming out wave with the going in wave at each frequency. Yeah, that's the and loss or, probably we'll see. The loss, we'll yeah. see that very clearly, exactly right. And so we're going to look at the S parameters for the uniform line. I've got exactly the same uh, uh, river meander. Uh, we'll look at that. And I have exactly the same trombone. So we'll look at the same thing in the time domain and the frequency domain. Mm -hmm. And this is for the microstrip. And I built exactly the same structure over here in strip line. How much time did you spend building these? Uh, it's pretty fast. And this is a project that I do for one of my classes. I teach oh, okay. this in the advanced PCB class. Uh, but I, hey, I would do it for you, Robert. No problem. <laughs> I, I wish I could say, oh, it took me days to build this. But but in all fairness to ADS, it is pretty fast to do this sort of thing. But you need but to you understand to, all these things to build it quickly. Yeah. You know, and you have to pay attention to all the details. And you ask my students, and they'll be the first to tell you, I'm not very detail oriented. And so I make mistakes sometimes. So it, there's a little bit of, you know, keeping track of the variables and making sure everything is consistent. And so that's, that's why rule number nine is so important for me, because, you know, I make mistakes and rule number nine is how I often find them. That's why it's so important. So the difference between this structure and the microstrip is the stack up. Mm -hmm. So here's the substrate three I'm using. It's three layer. So it's ground signal ground. It's symmetric in this case. I've got the same dielectric constant. I have a different thickness. So I get 50 ohms. I got the same half ounce copper, same conductivity, same dielectric constant, same dissipation factor. Otherwise, every they're all the same. So I won't have foreign crosstalk in this structure. Okay. So now we see how it's set up. Uh, we have four simulations we're going to do. Uh, two microstrip time and frequency, two strip line time and frequency. And now let's see how I have the transient simulation set up. So it's six inches long. So what would you roughly estimate the time delay to be for this meander? Six inches long. Uh, I. I know you always tell this and I always forget. <laughs> I don't know. Really easier. So, and I apologize. I mean, I'm used to the imperial units, but it's it's uh, six inches. So it's six inches per nanosecond or 15 centimeters per nanosecond. Okay. So six inches, 15 centimeters, just a nanosecond. So Roughly about a nanosecond? nanosecond. Yeah, about a nanosecond. Okay. And and we'll compare it to the straight one. And so now let's see how I have, let's see how, how I have the, the setup here. So I'm going to make the rise time Right now it's 50 picoseconds. I'm going to make that a little bit longer. Let's make it 200 picoseconds. Um, let's see, I have it six inches. I have, uh, let's start with it far apart so that we turn off the coupling. Just consistency test, mm -hmm. make sure, hey, I shouldn't see an impact of the mm -hmm. interconnect. So make that 25. So it's five line widths apart. And, and I think I have, so everything else is going to auto adjust. I think I have the, um, the line width, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, dielectric thicknesses for the, this is going to be for the microstrip, here's strip line. I think I have that adjusted so that I will have 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and when we look at the, you know, the signal coming back, that'll tell us pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if it's, uh, if, if we don't have any extra reflection initially, that'll tell us 50 ohms. And we'll see it in the return loss, the reflected signal, because we don't have much reflecting back in the frequency. I mean, that says, hey, 50 ohms. Okay. So now I've got it all set. So there's a big circuit simulation. It'll take a little, a couple of seconds to simulate. I'm going to just, you know, just, I'm going to, well, we won't save it. Already saved. I'm going to run it and let's see what happens. So running so the simulation. everything should be okay now because the elements are far away from each other. Yep, right. And so, yeah, it's just telling me, hey, you got two simulations you're doing. You're a transient time domain and a frequency domain. But while I'm doing the frequency domain, I can't do the transient. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's telling me. Um, which is a warning, so it's it's not a problem. And uh, uh, let's see, I started the simulation. Uh, and so my poor little computer is working its little heart out. Let's see if we can see the... Uh, okay, let's see, simulate. Okay, there we go. So it's simulating away. I'm looking at, I don't know if you can see here, mm -hmm. this is my core, 16 core. It's working pretty hard to do all these simulations. Uh, and... Um, and let's see. So, oh, and we're done. Okay, cool. 
Now let's take a look at the results here. Okay. Yeah, okay. So here's my window. I'm gonna make it big. And and then we're gonna move things around a little bit. Okay, so let's first look over here. This mm -hmm. is the microstrip and I labeled them so we can see them. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, remember what we did, this is uncoupled. This is basically, you know, traces far apart, uh, legs far apart and, um, and they're microstrip. And here is the signal coming out of the driver. And here is the signal that uh, uh, is at the receiver. Mm -hmm. And you can see that, you know, it's about yeah. um, a nanosecond delay, about what we expect, a little bit less than that because it's microstrip. And very similar, slight difference. Let's see. So the river is a little tiny. I don't know if you can you see that. Let me zoom in a little bit more. There's the, the red is the river. So mm -hmm. there's just this tiny earlier period of time than the other two. And that's because, okay, even though they're five line widths apart, there's a tiny little bit of coupling. And I get a little bit faster speed because there's a little bit more field in air uh, in that case, but mm -hmm. tiny, tiny impact. Otherwise, they're basically the same the signals, almost identical. I really can't tell them apart in microstrip. So that's going to be the transmitted signal. No coupling, no impact. Don't worry about the meander. Doesn't matter whether it's river accordion or if it's um, the trombone, you get the same behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you keep the spacing far enough mm -hmm. apart. Okay, now let's look at the frequency domain. And so in the frequency domain, here is, so it's a little complicated and I, I, maybe I'll just give you the big picture here. So the vertical, so the horizontal is the frequency and I'm going to 20 gigahertz. So here's two gigahertz, four, six. The vertical scale is the ratio of the signal coming out compared to the signal going in. So, but this is the reflected signal. This is, I sent a sine wave in, how much reflects back? And, and so, and it's in dB. And so the larger, more negative dB, the less is coming back. Mm -hmm. And so let's look at- um, So, and that's better. Right. So, uh, let's, did I get the right colors? Let's see if I, I wanted to get the color matched. Uh, let's see, uh, that one, straight uh, trombone. Yes, they okay, are yeah. same. So I do have the right colors. Okay, good. So, um, the, the blue is the straight. That's a uniform transmission line. I shouldn't expect, if it's 50 ohms, nothing should come back and look. It's a really large negative dB, minus 40 dB. That says less than 1% of the signals coming back. Nothing's a good impedance match. So that's good. The red is the river. And you can see that the red, wow, not much is coming back, but uh-oh, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, big. But look, it's at nine gigahertz. And that's related to the length of the couple region. Mm -hmm. The shorter it is, the higher the frequency I'm going to push that peak in the reflected signal. That's the far end crosstalk coming back to me. So is, and it, the larger, is it like a quarter or half of the length? Something yeah, from it's like that. Okay. Yeah. I'm not exact. I have to sit down and kind of work it out and figure out the waves there, but it's something on that order. Mm -hmm. But it's related to that coupled length. Mm -hmm. And it's the far end crosstalk. And so this says, oh my gosh, at nine gigahertz, almost minus 10 dB comes back. I'm in a C. If something comes back, that means it's not going forward. Mm -hmm. And so I expect to see a dip in the signal coming back around nine gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And now the green is the trombone. You can see, look, you have a lot of these peaks because it's a longer coupling length. The frequency at which it couples is going to be a lower frequency. And sure enough, look, here it is for the accordion that are short. Here it is for the trombone that are long, but it's the peaks are at lower frequency, but they happen, they're less amount because there's less um, uh, amount of coupling during that, that low frequency, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, you know, is minus 25 dB, is that a lot? I mean, that's not much. So, but again, we're uncoupled, right? Doesn't matter. So this is just a, a glimpse at in the frequency domain, we have a much more sensitive measure of what's going on than in the time domain. That's why I like looking in the frequency domain because it doesn't tell you, do I care? Is it important? Is this gonna affect my signal? But it tells you, this is the behavior of the interconnect. Mm -hmm. it, it looks under the hood at the underlying properties of the interconnect and shows these, these resonances. It's so that's the reflection. how harmonic yeah. it is. Well, and that's because of the nature of, you got a fixed length, 
as you go up in frequency, you're gonna get one wave, then two waves, then three waves, then four waves, then five waves that resonate in this structure. They're resonant systems. And that, that is one of the indications of a resonant structure is it's periodic in frequency. So this is reflected. Now let's look at the transmitted signal. So here's the transmitted. So here again, same frequency. Here is the ratio of what comes out compared to what goes in. And you'll notice here's the, look at the, let's see if so I can So now get the, lower the, is worse. The, lower is less signal, yeah. less signals coming through. And you can see the blue is the straight line. And look, it's dropping off. That's because like you said earlier, the losses, the higher the frequency, the more the losses. And, but it's pretty monotonic, it's pretty flat. It's got the conductor and the dielectric losses, just because I'm using FR4, six inches long. And now let's look at the river. It's also pretty darn flat, except for, oh my gosh, look, can you see that little dip mm -hmm. here? Let me make it a little bigger. Here, nine oops, gigahertz. here it is at nine gigahertz, because we reflected some extra energy. Uh, we're not going to have as much going forward. Mm -hmm. Tiny impact, not much coupling. And you can see the impact of those reflections in the um, the trombone. We see it happening at lower frequency. And again, it's small effect, lower frequency, and it gets bigger and bigger as we get a higher frequency. This is so, so cool. I, I would never say is cool? there is so much like happening behind these language matching. But keep in mind, we are this is uncoupled, so it's a who cares? No difference from a time domain performance. This is such a sensitive measure that we're revealing these behaviors that are below the surface. We're gonna bring the legs close together and we're gonna see some pretty dramatic impacts here in a second. Okay, so this is in microstrip and we do the same thing in strip line. But remember- This is interesting. Far... I would like to point out first, notice the uh, difference in the delay. That's <gasps> very good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's if see, we compare I... it to the, when you compare strip line and micro strip, you can see uh, routing tracks on the top layer or inside of PCB, it makes difference. Here we go. Yeah. Let's, let's zoom out on this. So I superimpose the scales are all the same and you're absolutely right. The micro strip has a shorter delay because the time delay is is um, the speed is is faster because there's part in air uh, faster than uh, in the buried layer because the air compared to the buried not a big impact but yeah and that you take that into account when you calculate the delay length and you know all the tool you know Altium does that automatically for you, you give it the stack up um, you use actually it uses Yuri Shlepnev's uh, 2D field solver built in um, to calculate the the um, uh, the delays. Yeah, uh, but I think it's important. I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, yeah, what I would go. like to point out, uh, because sometimes people do length matching based on the length, and it means they they think like I have total length same for all the tracks, but if they have a longer uh, part of the track routed on the top layer, and then uh, the other one other signal is routed all inside of the PCB there still may be difference when the signals will arrive. Yeah, absolutely right. You, when you take a look at the total path length and you want to match the total path length, you have to take into account the length in the microstrip and the strip on layers and you know core prepreg layers as well. And I think Altium takes that into account automatically when you say calculate the delay of this mm -hmm. net, as long as you have the stack up uh, correct. And when you're designing the meander, um, uh, you can specify in this, put, put it in this region, use this space uh, uh, and total length and, um, uh, and, and you want to keep the length so that in that region, it gives you the delay that you're looking for. But you're right, you have to take into account the dielectric constants of the, of the various layers. Okay, so make it clear. So, the first one is the one which is routed on the yeah, top this or is, bottom Yeah, this layer. is micro strip yeah. and this is strip line. It's inside strip of the line PCB. Is, yes, it's buried, so it's going to see the higher effective dielectric constant mm -hmm. in, in the material. It means okay, see there can... is more resistance when the fields are traveling. Uh, I wouldn't say resistance. It just means there's more delay. Okay. Uh, now I have to be careful to get these in the right order. So this is the microstrip one that goes back up there. Let's move him up there. And then here's the strip line one. Let's move him a little closer. Okay. <clears throat> 
Oh, yeah. The, see if I got the that second right. graph is right. like very different too. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. So so we looked at the delay that hey look in strip line, it looks just about the same as microstrip. Can't tell them apart, except for like you just said, a little longer delay. Again, uncoupled. So we're five line widths away. Now we look at the return loss, and yeah, you're right. Um, let me move this out of the way as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a uh, look at what we had in strip line. Far and crosshawk sent signal coming back. We don't have far and crosshawk in strip line. And so we, we have just this tiny little hint of something going on here, uh, but it's t in the noise. I can't, I can't really see it very much. No impact all, obviously in the, uh, in the time domain. They're all basically the same. In, nothing comes back in strip line because no far and crosshawk. So this means... But, Doing line yeah. matching inside of the PCB is much, much better than doing it on the top and bottom uh, here. I'm not sure if we can put a value judgment on it just yet. All we can say is um, it's better. There's, it's, it, there's no impact from okay. the, the interconnects are transparent. And look what happens in the transmitted signal. Nice. Wow. I, I don't see any, any impact at all in the transmitted signal. It's all they're all exactly the same. The interconnects are transparent, whether I'm using the river or I'm using the trombone, same behavior as a straight, if it's uncoupled. And mm -hmm. that was what we thought. We said, hey, if it's uncoupled, there shouldn't be any impact. Okay. There isn't. Now let's go back and let's turn on coupling and see <clears throat> what the impact is. And uh, so let's see. Uh, so here's our, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to close this one out here so that we don't have it to confuse us. Okay. So we are going to change so, the space between yeah, the Yeah, exactly. So, so this is where I like having things parameterized because now all we have to do is we had a spacing of 25 mils. Mm -hmm. What should we make it? What would you like Five. to shoot for? Same, same width. Five. Oh, you really want to go aggressive here. Okay. Uh, because so this is what, really... I, what I've seen many times. People are using Yeah, right. Yeah. We're going to make them really tightly spaced. Okay, so I make the one change and it's going to ripple through all of our designs. So uh, let's let it rip. And so we're going to see, yeah, it's giving us that warning because it's can't do the transient when we're doing the frequency, but that's okay. We'll still do it. It's setting up the simulator. I'm, I'm good. It's got, I'm really it's got all those field solver <laughs> things to do. So keep our fingers crossed that it's not going to um, blow up. I don't think it will. <laughs> Uh, but we'll see. If it does, and yeah, we can tweak a few things to. Oh, you think it it's too stable. close? Well, again, it's we have so much coupling, and we have all of those legs. Sometimes it blows up, but we'll see. Okay, it's doing it. We're getting the frequency domain simulation because it's losses. After the transient simulation of the losses, it does a lot of convolution integrals with that. Um, it's doing a lot of calculation here to sixteen. Oh, we're done. <gasps> cool. Oh, okay. Okay. So let's look at the same thing we had before. Now, remember, this is 200 picosecond rise time. So the bandwidth for 200 picoseconds is, let's see, about 0.35 over 0.2. So the bandwidth is about, you know, two gigahertz or so. Not real high bandwidth. Uh, let's see. What we see. So here's a signal coming out of the It's like transmitter. PCI Express, for example. Old one. Uh, old one. Yeah, right. Two, two dot uh, two a gen point, one. I think five. Is, Two and a half, uh, five gigabit. The whole unit interval is the so PCI Express Gen Two is five gigabit. The unit interval is two hundred picoseconds. So that's a fifty picosecond rise time. So should we should we do that? Do a a a, a, a fifty picosecond rise time? Because we are using two hundred picoseconds right now. Right, right. So this is DDR three. Okay. DDR four. Okay. So let's have a look on DDR four. Kind of, yeah. Okay. So here's so let's see what we've got. We have a bigger difference now between, remember the, the, the blue is straight. Mm -hmm. So this is the reference. Beautiful, mm -hmm. nice looking signal, mm -hmm. a little rise time degradation because of the losses, but looks great. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, now we come to uh, green is the trombone. Mm -hmm. And you can see that, you know, we get this precursor guy here, like we predicted, because the near end crosstalk, and, um, and we get this, you know, little earlier launch here. And otherwise, oh, but we get this overshoot over here. So there's some distortion of the signal. And uh, depending on what the unit interval is, 
uh, the precursor here and the overshoot here, they're going to add or subtract on the resulting eye. That's going to give us a little bit of collapse of the eye, mm -hmm. and it's going to give us a little bit of deterministic jitter, mm -hmm. a little bit of deterministic jitter. So that's going to affect the eye a little bit. And now here in red, this is the meander, the, or I'm sorry, the river or the accordion, and you can see it comes in earlier. And I think that's because of the extra fringe fields because they're close together and the signals are, are uh, you get a lot of field in the um, uh, region above the traces. And so I think that is just the added factor of um, a lower effective dielectric constant for the signal. Turns on really nice, get a tiny little bit of ripple over here. Otherwise, looks pretty good. So which one of these is better? Well, I don't know, I think the trombone would probably give us a little bit more intersimilar interference. The, but the red, the, the river, is going to give us a little shorter delay that we have to take that into account with a field solver when we do the mm -hmm. design of the accordion. Now, that's the time domain I have, of the skin I have microstrip. So yeah. now make it clear why only the green one has the initial state a little bit. Right. So it's we saw before that this is the transmit. It's all about the near end crosstalk. And the near end crosstalk lasts for a time roughly twice the the the, the time delay of each coupled leg. Oh, the trombone so because has there long, is longer length. So it couple. lasts for a little longer and we see the, the length of time. It lasts for you know a fraction of a you know, maybe 0.2 nanoseconds, 0.3 nanoseconds. So it lasts for that time delay of the long line. For the river, the time delay of each segment is really, really short. Mm -hmm. And and we still have that effect, but it's smeared out in this rising edge because that time delay is really short. If we go to 10 picoseconds, we'll see it. Mm -hmm. If we And we'll see a lot more behavior over here if we go to shorter rise time. Okay, and so, so, we'll so next. basically the difference is that if there are many segments in parallel, that's better than uh, less but long segments. Oh, many right. short if there are many segments. Short, mm -hmm. Very good. Yes. That's many better short. than few long elements. Right. And we'll see that when we go to the frequency domain, because we'll see how we have pushed the resonant frequency to higher frequency with the short legs compared to the long legs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's look in. So this is time domain. We see a difference now clearly. It looks like the the red with a band the the signal is has bandwidth of about two gigahertz or so in the two gigahertz region looks like the red is a little cleaner than the the trombone now let's look in the frequency domain and so here in the frequency domain we see some really big differences this is the reflected signal so blue is the straight exactly what we had before mm -hmm. no impact we haven't changed anything with it we see now that the coupling in the in the river, the accordion, oh my gosh, look, we have the periodicity here of the whole thing going back and forth. That's the whole total length. That's the periodicity of the whole length. It's short frequency periodicity corresponding to the same one as reflections back and forth. We see the, um, the, uh, the trombone, we see its periodicity. And look, we see this big peak at around nine gigahertz, what we saw before, but look how big it is. This is a huge, reflection coming back. Mm -hmm. This behavior, just to put a name on it, this is due to a periodic, not so much a discontinuity, it's not a reflection, but a periodic impact on the reflected signal. This is referred to as a block wave, named after Felix Block. It's the same behavior that gives rise to um, energy band gaps in semiconductors. It's about the reflections back of electron waves propagating through a crystal and there are certain frequencies, energy levels of electrons that don't propagate, they reflect back. This is named after Felix Bloch who discovered it. This is a block wave effect in a transmission line. So does it mean that, if if you do length matching uh, and you by accident uh, make the length of these uh, segments uh, the 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 Right, a, wave, a between, wavelength corresponding to you know frequency to, to the signal, signal which you are going to transfer, then you completely damage your signal. Yeah, in fact, um, <laughs> if you had, but look at the frequency, because they're so short, 
right? The resonant frequency is nine gigahertz. If you used this interconnect, this meander, to send a signal at nine gigahertz, then all of it, almost all of it, you know, what's the amplitude here? It's it's two dB minus two dB. It's it's like I, you know, I can see it on the right graph. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna see that in a second. Eighty percent gets reflected back. Nothing gets through. The technical term for that situation is you're screwed. You 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 have just screwed your signal. Here it is as the transmitted signal. This is where inter the internet is not transparent at, at nine gigahertz. Look yeah. at this. This is the transmitted signal. Blue is what we had before. Everything is normal. Here in red is the accordion. Look, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Uh oh, there's <sighs> nothing coming back. At nine gigahertz, nothing is because it all got reflected. Wow. And that says if you use this particular meander at nine gigahertz, you're screwed. Any frequency components at nine gigahertz. Uh, won't get through. Mm -hmm. So that means you know, 18 gigabit per second, yeah. 20 gigabit per second. Uh, it, 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 you'll have a close, completely close. Wow, by. I had no idea. This, but nobody's going to use this at 20 gigahertz, your gigabit per second. Um, and if they did, they better. They, hopefully, they would be aware of this effect. And how do you get a rid of? How do you get rid of this? What did we see in the first simulation? Where we didn't see this in the first simulation. How come? We because, turned the uh, coupling off. Yeah. We separated the legs so oh, yeah. far, okay. there was no coupling. That's true. And so you can still use the same leg length and, and all that and for a delay, but just turn the coupling okay. off. Okay, yeah. That's, that's why this kind of simulation with an integrated 2D field solver is so important because it takes into account the long-range coupling from leg to leg, mm. and it shows this behavior. And so if you don't want to see this block wave resonance, then turn off the coupling, make the legs far enough apart. So that's why you it say, means, uh, even if people do the leg matching with this very small spacing, it can be fine, because if they are using right. different frequencies, because everything will work fine. Yeah, if your bandwidth, you know, we had a was 200 picosecond edge in this example, bandwidth is like two gigahertz. Look at two gigahertz, it's perfectly fine, mm -hmm. below two gigahertz. There, it is as transparent as the straight line mm -hmm. is. This is a who cares, oh. even with the tight coupling, it's a who cares. The interconnect is transparent at that at those frequencies. And that's the value of looking at the frequency and it tells you the big picture. It's really, really sensitive and it tells you at what frequency you have to worry. I'd start worrying when we got into the seven gigahertz range and seven gigahertz is, you know, 50 picosecond rise time. So 50 picoseconds, you know, probably be okay. 20 picoseconds, you're screwed. So that's how we interpret this. That's for micro strip with the close coupled meander. Okay. Let's look at the trombone. The trombone, oh my gosh, here, what's our signal? Our signal is at two gigahertz. Wow, we're getting this resonant coupling coming back. We're getting a lot of stuff coming back. And beyond that, if we had shorter rise in the two hundred, we would have more problems coming back. And look at the transmitted signal. So here it is. We see, you know what, at two gigahertz, I'm getting a little bit extra mm -hmm. loss. And we kind of saw that we get some distortion. This gives us this and the reflected signal gives us distortion. That's why we see the precursor, we see the overshoot. And now if we had higher frequency comments, oh my gosh, if we had, uh, what's that, three gigahertz, if we had a hundred picosecond rise time signal, we would not, we would have a rise time, just, we would not have a hundred picoseconds coming out. We would have the distortion from these dips here and if we had, here's five gigahertz, uh, let's see, five gigahertz is like um, 70 picoseconds. We, we would have a lot of, lot more distortion. Mm -hmm. and, and because of the, the peaks in the reflective signal, these dips are here in the transmitted is because we have so much reflected back that it's stealing energy from that transmitted signal. That's why we have those peaks, mm -hmm. those dips. So frequency only tells us a lot of, I don't have to run every single rise time to get a feel for what's going to happen. I know if I go to, you know, rise time, this bandwidth, I'm screwed. That's, I'm not going to have anything left. And if I go to a rise time at this band, nine gigahertz for the, the accordion, I'm screwed. No, we will do one more simulation then. I, I'm really curious. Okay. How they okay. We're not done yet. We have to look at strip okay. line. So we said, uh oh, with micro strip, be very careful. Clearly, short, many short is better than mm -hmm. a few long. Mm -hmm. If there's no coupling, who cares? Mm -hmm. Do whatever you want. If 
if um, there is if no you, space and if you need to route them close to right, each other. If you have to get them close in microstrip, then you want to use um, short coupled lines, um, but be wary of the block wave resonance and make sure that they're short enough mm -hmm. so you've pushed the block wave resonance well above the bandwidth of your signal. Mm -hmm. And if you're not quite sure, you should run a simulation like this. Hyperlinks or ADS are great tools to do this kind of thing. Okay, so that's microstrip. Now let's look at strip line. So same thing as strip line. Let's just compare these two. Wow. See yeah, it, it looks. So you know what? Uh, still, I look at, I got some distortion here in strip line. Even though there's no yeah. far end crosstalk, here it's because of the near end crosstalk. Here's my precursor. And here's my over, just like I saw over here in microstrip. But remember, in strip line, we, we're using the same five mil wide line, five mil space. And in strip line, because the dielectric layers are far, the planes are farther away, there's more coupling mm -hmm. between two adjacent mm -hmm. lines at then five mil space than, mm -hmm. in, than in microstrip. And so we have more coupling, more near and crosstalk between legs mm -hmm. in strip line. We have a bigger impact. We have a bigger precursor wow. here, and we have a bigger postcursor here. This is all near and crosstalk effect. And look, we have this behavior here. It's a little hard to see, but this is the precursor near end crosstalk in strip line. We can't see it because at 200 picoseconds, they're all smeared out, but we see the impact of giving us that shorter rise time and a little bit of overshoot here. Mm -hmm. But still the same impact. So it's a little shorter delay. There's more edge to edge coupling. So we're getting that signal propagating across the, the river a little bit in addition to having to snake its, all, its way all the way through it. And so again, easy to estimate ahead of time, tight coupling. Just means that you know, it's, it's gonna be a little shorter time delay than you'd expect just from the total length, path length. So that's looking in the time domain. And now we look in the frequency. Here's the transmitted signal. And look, oh my gosh, hardly any. Mm -hmm. This is this is that 1% level. Yeah, we see the block wave effect just because, oh, you know what? I don't know if it's numerical noise in the, in the field solver or you know what, but it's a tiny effect. Uh, third order effect, no impact on the reflected signal. It's all basically flat. And here it is in the frequency domain. And so here's where it's kind of interesting. That, that coupling forward at different frequencies gives rise to this kind of distortion. That blue again is the straight line, great. Red is the, uh, the uh, river or the, mm -hmm. uh, the accordion. And look, we're starting to get a little bit higher attenuation at some frequencies. And this is not so much due to the, uh, what's the way to describe it? It's not the fact that we have reflections and distortion. It's not because the loss is different. It's related to the dispersion. The fact that we have over here, we have this edge getting out earlier than we expect means different frequencies because they're going to couple through that edge. They're going to propagate at different speeds. This structure has dispersion. And that dispersion is giving us this little bit of waviness in the insertion loss. And so it says, hey, you're going to get a little bit more loss at 4 gigahertz. Again, if this is, um, let's see, two, what do we say, 200 picoseconds, that's that's uh, about you know close to two gigahertz bandwidth. At two gigahertz, it's a who cares? Absolutely identical, even mm -hmm. in the tightest coupling. But if we're going to 100 picoseconds, you know, closer to four gigahertz bandwidth, we would we would see a little bit more loss. We'd see a little bit more dispersion. And the trombone, look, we get that periodicity there because of the the block the the periodic coupling in the forward direction and the dispersion in the forward direction. I, I was setting up to look at the dispersion over here and I I didn't really finish it. So it's a little complicated, but looking at the phase delay of the signal, mm -hmm. they're different. So it's varying. And that, and that's really uh, ultimately why we're getting this kind of behavior here in the in the insertion loss. I have, so it says, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I really remember that. You know, it's, it says that, okay, in tightly coupled structure, um, both microstrip and strip line are gonna work, tightly coupled. You always wanna use the shorter uh, line segments more, but shorter line segments, because that's going to push the resonant up to higher frequency. Um, microstrip and strip line are both going to work, 
you just have to be a little careful to pay attention to in the bandwidth of the signals you're using is it still going to be suitable mm -hmm. so uh, now i'm getting this idea like why this frequency graphs are important because in the time domain we are looking at specific signal one specific signal but one specific but rise time, if we right? have a look on the on the we, we can't see all the kind of signals in frequency we can see how this is going to influence all the kind of signals it means if we pick up a signal which will be exactly uh, 9 gigahertz then the time domain signal will look completely bad i guess exactly right and so it gives us it's it's a more sensitive um, a description of the electrical behavior of the interconnect. And because it tells us across the whole frequency range, it gives us the whole complete picture all at once. Mm -hmm. It is more, the, the, the price you pay for that more complete description is, it's a little more complicated because you have to retrain your thinking of frequency domain instead of time domain. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I always say, I think it's really important for um, signal integrity engineers to learn to become bilingual to think in the time domain and the frequency domain. They each tell a different piece of the story. And the more you can learn to think in both domains, the more complete picture you're gonna have of the behavior of the interconnect. Okay, I have one question. Uh, yeah. Why the straight line also has these waves in this frequency domain? Right, so you, 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 yes. these little ripples yes. here and here? Yeah. Okay. So remember, I said that when I set up the structure, I, I kept the line with the same, kept the dielectric on the same, but I changed the dielectric thickness to give me 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. But it's not the, the terminals on the ends where, where I'm doing the S parameters, they're 50 ohms exactly. But the, the dielectric thickness isn't perfectly adjusted to give me exactly 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit off. And this oh, is a okay. measure of the reflections. And so I'm seeing, seeing the periodic reflections back and forth mm -hmm. from the whole a length bit. of the resonance, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that tells me, and because it's really long electrically from the ends, that means the frequency interval between those peaks is gonna be really short. And that's what we're seeing here. So that's because of the, eh, it's not exactly 50 ohms. And if what I, is the frequency of this? What is this separation yeah. frequency? It's related to um, the frequency at which I first get a half a wave uh, between the two ends of the transmission so line. So it's, uh, it's related to the length of the... The length of the whole transmission mm -hmm. line. Okay. Right, and reflections from the ends. Okay, so let's and do the last simulation in, because you don't have much time. What would you like? Time. Yeah, uh, what, would you, what would you like? Nine gigahertz. So uh, what do you, what change do you the do? rise time to nine gigahertz. Okay, well... Okay, so let's see. So that would be about 0.35 over over nine is about um, uh, 40. Uh, for, uh, uh, let's see, 40 picoseconds or so. I'm not sure the simulation is going to run without um, causing a uh, um, uh, a uh, Problem. instability. Okay, so but let's, let's try. Let's, it. Maybe we can use a we'll little bit it. wider space if it's needed. Uh, okay, let's see. Well, I don't have a lot of, if I make it wider space there, you're not going to see the coupling. Okay. So tell you what, let's try it and see. Let's try, um, uh, let's try, uh, let's try 40, 04. And, and we'll see if it'll simulate. Okay, so let it run. So we'll watch and see. Uh, again, this is because we're doing a transient and, and frequency domain. So 40 is the uh, nine gigahertz? P yeah, so 40 picosecond rise time is a bandwidth of about 9 gigahertz. Okay. So it's about 0.35 over 0.04. That's about 9. So nine now gigahertz. we should hit the area where the signal should be kind of really bad. Yeah, so we're going to suck out energy at the high energy. So we'll see enhanced ringing around there. Let's see. So we're we're doing the frequency of the simulation because of the, all the losses in there. Uh Let's see, adaptive spacing. It's doing a lot of work here. Okay, and we're done. Almost done. We're at 12 gig, we're doing up to 20 gig. Ah, we're done, okay. So uh, the frequency is all the same. That hasn't changed, right? So let's look at the time domain. So here's the microstrip. So here's the uh, reflected sig signal around nine gig. Here's nothing's getting through at nine gig. 
And so you take it, you know, relatively uniform, you pull out nine gig, you're going to see ringing. And here's that ringing at the, you know, nine gigahertz. We see a little bit of precursor here, just the barest hint of it. That's the precursor coming out. And here you can see, you know, here's a leg, here's a leg, here's a leg. Because after all, every leg gets coupled to the next, to the next, to the next. And we're seeing it cascading. Uh, here's that big ringing because we've taken out the nine gigahertz. We're left with this fast ringing here. Uh, the trombone which looks basically the same. Okay, so Here's when, the... when you say we taken out the nine gigahertz, it means we couldn't make the nice shape because one frequency is missing. Right. That's why the right. shape is not perfect. Right, because we've taken out that very sharp nine gigahertz mm -hmm. frequency range. Otherwise, I mean, you look in the in the um, the this is the transfer function. This is what gets transmitted. Yeah, you're losing a little bit of energy, slowing the edge down a little bit. But oh my gosh, anything at the you know, basically eight gigahertz and above is removed. It's a cliff wall. It's kind of like sometimes we refer to it as Gibbs ringing. It's the artifact you see in a signal when you artificially take out some of the extra high frequencies in it. You see the residual ringing, and that's and that's exactly what we see here. It's kind of a Gibbs ringing effect because we've taken out those high frequencies. But it's interesting. And in it is in both cases. So bad. Right. So here it is in, in strip line, and you can see, look at this, you can see each one of those steps, right? That's the, the precursors of, of propagating through the interconnect. And you have, have this ring here, and now let's, let's see what we've got here. So, so this is, this behavior I think is slightly different from this. This was a Gibbs ring. In this case here, we, we've, we've taken out, we have a little bit higher lower loss. It doesn't tell the whole picture. You have to look at the phase, and again, I, I didn't finish this prop to show the speed of the signal of the dispersion. But this ringing here, I think, is part of the dispersion because different frequencies are traveling at different speeds mm -hmm. because they couple different amounts down the interconnect. Mm -hmm. This tells you, oh my gosh, you know, big difference in the delay when they're tightly coupled and when they're when they're straight, when it's straight, big difference in the delay. That says this is going to be a frequency dependent delay. And that's going to give us the you know, if I had plotted it, we would have seen ripples in the delay. And that's what causes this kind of artificial ringing. We, we see the barest hint of a block wave effect um, because of the uh, re reflections, tiny, tiny amount. But again, we're very sensitive in the frequency. Okay, so this is interesting. So it and looks so, very similar, but it caused different... Yeah. Um... So this says, oh my gosh, if you want a delay line and strip line and, and your signals are going to have an eight nine gigahertz bandwidth don't keep them tightly coupled don't you know we have them tightly you, you can make a delay line but don't make it tightly coupled or make them really short i don't know if you can physically make it short enough so that you push that resonant frequency the block wave frequency to much higher frequency but that's what you have to worry about if you're dealing with signals that are in the couple gigahertz range like we said it's a who cares but when you get above a couple gigahertz you got to worry about the resonance. And as a rough general rule, unless you're going to do the detailed analysis, many short coupled segments, segments is always better than a few mm -hmm. long coupled segments. That's what I always and, somehow knew. <laughs> and now we see why. I, I would like to say thank you very much because this, this is like super useful and I really hope it will help many people. Yep, always a pleasure. And this is, this is. I, I will do one last plug. So, at, at here at CU in Boulder, we are putting together a professional master's program in signal integrity and high-speed digital engineering, and this sort of thing about understanding the properties of interconnects, how to use some of these simulation tools. This is the kind of stuff that we're teaching in our master's program. And so, if any of your viewers are interested in uh, pursuing it, um, I'll, I'll send you the uh, URL link. For our math, we're just starting it coming up in the spring of 2023, and some of your viewers may be interested in in checking out our master's program. Is it going to be uh, like in person, or it's going to be also online class? A or? little mixed. We're going to have a couple of courses that can be done remotely, and most of it, it's a master's to your master's program, so it'll be in, in on on At site university. on campus. Mm -hmm. But there will be some classes that will be done that will be accessible remotely. Okay. Okay. And we'll talk more about it in some of the, the next videos. Okay.
So perfect. Thank you. I will keep this in the Great. video. Okay, super. Great. Thank you, Eric. Hey, always a pleasure, Robert. We'll talk to you next time. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. And uh, that's everything for this video. I would like to say thank you very much to Eric for sharing all this information with us. Thank you, Eric. And if you have any questions or feedback, please leave them in the comments under this video. It's uh, very motivating to read your comments. You know, if there is only a few comments, then I'm not sure if you really like the video and uh, what you liked or possibly if you didn't like it or what you didn't like. Okay, so please leave your comments. Thank you. Of course, if you like this video, don't forget to press like button. If you would like to be notified about my future videos, don't forget to subscribe. I would like to thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.